Hi, um, everyone. Uh, welcome to the US Game Changers session. I'm Stuart Murphy from Sky. Um, uh, it's my absolute pleasure to be interviewing one of the biggest names in American broadcasting. Uh, we'll go through his resume in a second, but he started off prestigiously in the mailroom, uh, uh, William Morris Endeavor, or William Morris. Uh, then worked at Nickelodeon, uh, helped launch FX, worked at Fox, um, then ran Disney Channels Worldwide, chairman of Disney Studios, CEO of Shine America, and is now the uh, snappily titled <laughs> group president of Discovery Channel, Animal Planet, and Science Channel. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Rich Ross. How are you? Good to be here. <laughs> it's like your fourth time in Edinburgh, is that right? But your first time at the festival. No, my third time at the festival. <laughs> uh, I came here 20 years ago uh, when I worked for Nickelodeon. And I came here 10 years ago when I worked for Disney. Um, and now, you know, every couple of years you get a new job, you come back to Edinburgh <laughs> and to make sure you, you know you have a new job. We, um, we were at the McTaggart dinner last night after the thing on uh, possibly the funniest table. <laughs> <laughs> so we were next to, um, oh, well, I'll say it anyway, probably a bit indiscreet, but we were, Rich didn't know who Sue Perkins was from Bake Off, um, <laughs> and uh, so we were sitting next to Sue. She doesn't was, seem like much of a baker. When yeah. her. But then she was opposite John Whittingdale, um, who, uh, she doesn't really share John's views, so uh, they got pissed, and then Sue kept standing behind John with a fake knife pretending to stab his head. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and then Rich was sort of trying to calm them down, but it was a proper full-on humdinger for several hours. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> like, welcome to Edinburgh TV Festival, Rich. Uh, so, uh, should we chat about how you first became obsessed with TV? So you were sure. a kid growing up in New York. Uh, your dad was in textiles, was it? And mum yeah. was a teacher and... Yeah, I, I, I didn't know, back in the day, which some of you may share, um, people did not think of television as something that would um, be bad for you. At the same time, back in the day, there was not a lot of television for kids. So um, I was a ravenous television viewer, and I would watch literally anything. And people would say to my mom, um, you even allow him to watch television when he does his homework. And he, she said, as long as he continues to do well in school. So I pretty much watched six and seven hours of telly every single day. And, uh, and I was very lucky that uh, my dad played um, in a tennis game every Friday night. Still, he's 89. He still doesn't play tennis, but the group is all still alive and kicking. And one of the people uh, worked at ABC, one of the television networks. And so it occurred to me very young, and very young, that you could have a career in television because my dad had a friend who had a career in television. Um, and it kind of went from there. So I did something very odd in that variety, the, the trade. I had a subscription since I was 12. <laughs> <laughs> and my parents, you know, everything, you know, you can get like Mad Magazine or you have some odd child who gets variety, but it sort of has somewhat, I guess, paid off. And what were, your, what were the shows you were obsessed with when you were younger? Well, what I was obsessed with Animation, um, because that was available. I was obsessed with um, sitcoms, because they had come into vogue in a very big way. And I was obsessed with soap operas. Which soap operas did you love? Oh, I watched them all. Oh, really? <laughs> I watched them all, and hours and end. And by the time I was in high school, um, I went to school for a couple of hours. I lived across the street from my school. And I would come home and just watch these bizarre stories about people who you start thinking is normal. Yeah, yeah, of course. You know, seven husbands, and like, this is what happens in the real world. <laughs> well, I guess it does, but, um, <laughs> but it was um, very much, it was just, you know, to me, soap operas and all these things all interrelate, and that's, as you go through your career, you, people are like, how do you know? And it's like stuff you've watched as a kid. So after, um, so university, I think you studied law, is that right? I, I studied uh, my, my, I went to University of Pennsylvania and I was an English major and an international relations major with a focus on Russian Soviet history, <laughs> which the Soviet part, you turn to young people and they're like, excuse me, what is that? Yeah. Um, and then um, I went to law school so uh, for three years to Fordham University. So, 
seven year run at school. I'm only laughing because that degree then <coughs> set you in really good stead for Disney and Nickelodeon. It's like the most inappropriate qualification to work in kids' TV. Well, they were, to this day, people were like, oh, you're a lawyer. And it was like, uh, by education. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, not, by, not by practice. So you started as a, as a male boy in WME. Um, uh, and as is the way with these conversations, people try and draw out themes. Is that where you started to get obsessed with dealing with talent or seeing celebrity or watching the agent talent relationship or not really, were you just delivering posts? No, well, the, well actually the, 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 the story of where it started was I um, went to meet the head of personnel for my first day of the summer and he said, okay, I can give you a tour of the office. So I thought, oh, so gracious and nice. And we walk into the mail room and it had a Xerox machine that back in the day was about twice the size of this table and that anyone thought it was safe to have then other people surrounding this thing that glowed green. Um, so I walk in, I see this giant Xerox machine and all these other mailroom people and then he starts walking out and so I follow him and he said, where are you going? And I said, I thought we're going on a tour. And he said, tour's over. <laughs> and in that moment, I realized that the, um, the, this myth and paradigm of the William Morris mailroom was literally a mailroom. It didn't occur to me that it was just, you know, a euphemism. And I was very lucky because in that first minute, um, one of the guys in the mailroom called me over and said, you know, he'll show me the ropes. He's now one of the owners of CA, Kevin Uvane, and a friend <laughs> of mine for over 35 years. But um, in that room are the people figuring out what's next, but it's also a basic job. Mm -hmm. So I got to work. I, my great superpower in this world is that I can type fast. And back in the day, that was like dramatic because boys didn't type. Well, my mother said, if I learned to type, I could go far. <laughs> and, far. and it worked. And it worked, I guess. <laughs> I guess it worked. Um, and so I got out of the mailroom. I was the first summer person ever in their history to get out of the mailroom and work. I worked for every single agent. I worked in music. I worked in personal appearances, work in literary. And it was the grad school. And I did it for summers through college and law school. So finally, by the end, they said to me, you have to become an agent. I said, no, I've been here for four summers, five summers. Uh, it's not what I want to do. Yeah. But it was a great, you know, uh, galvanizing of a career and an opportunity to learn a lot about a lot of businesses. Amazing. And so from there, did you join Nickelodeon or FX? Nickelodeon. A uh, friend of mine from university uh, had, a, had a job opportunity, and uh, she called me. And she said, uh, I work at Nickelodeon. And I said, what is that? <laughs> because at this point, I'm an adult. And cable television had certainly become something but it was not something on my radar. And so everybody always wonders, and I've worked a lot in uh, children's television, that that was my purpose, or my raison d'etre. Mm -hmm. And it was a coincidence about someone a year older than me in uni. Mm -hmm. And she had, a, I thought, a great job opportunity. And it was to create an award show that became Kids' Choice, and now all over the globe, and um, to start their talent department. And having worked at William Morris, and, and and just loving that part of the business. It was how do you get people to do things for the network? How do you get the faces in the network? And you know, it's never gone out of my vernacular because it's what we all look for in yeah, this yeah. business. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, so it's quite a jump then, I suppose, to set up FX. John Langraff from FX is here this week. FX feels quite a muscular channel and quite a, you know, uh, young lads channel. Uh, is that how it was conceived at the time or people thought it was Well, be it, the, the opportunity, um, I was, I had a great, one of the greatest opportunities I ever had. I wanted to work in the UK and my boss at that point uh, was Anne Sweeney and Anne came to me one day and she said, I have a great opportunity. Uh, we're going to open up Nickelodeon in the UK, which became the first US channel to open up globally seems crazy in light of all that has gone on since. And um, my, my favorite part of the story is she said, well, it's in London and that's where you want to be. And I said, yeah, and I've been to London many times, so I was very lucky. And um, she said, I'll fly over with you. And we were 10 minutes from Heathrow and we were just passing the glamorous Austerlitz campus. <laughs> and she said, oh my God, here's the office. 
And I said, we're not in London. She said, well, um, well, it's near London. It's near London. And I'm thinking, I've made a terrible mistake. But she said, uh, you know, that first trip would be three days. So I, we went to the hotel. She said, we'll have a quick breakfast. And then we'll, of course, make the pilgrimage out uh, back to Austerly. So I didn't wear a lot of suits in, the, in those days. I don't, frankly, probably wear a lot of suits now. I brought the two I had. I look at it after sleeping in three hours. I look in my little cupboard, and I realize I brought my suit and my tuxedo. <laughs> um, so it was like James Bond in a business trip. I was like, well, maybe that will come in handy, a fancy dress party within the three days. Um, suffice it to say, I stayed that first trip three weeks. Um, the sleeves of my jacket literally almost fell off, and I never did get to wear the tuxedo. And I worked for a company at that point, it was Viacom, that did a very classic thing with the company. Um, I could not buy new underwear because that was against company policy, but I could launder the underwear at the hotel. So by the time the, you know, the laundry bill was like hundreds and hundreds of quid, um, but I could never, and so it became a joke. People would like, um, for gag gifts, give me you know, packages of underwear. <laughs> it's mortifying. Um, but uh, FX at that point was to be a network um, that featured like live talent. And that was what... Live talent. Live talent. And, yeah. and Rupert Murdoch had called Anne and um, asked her if she would set up the cable division, uh, which didn't exist at Fox. And I came back from a trip from London. And she, clo you know, she said, come in, close the door. And I said, OK. She said, Rupert Murdoch called me. And he'd like me to set up the cable division. I was like, OK. And I said, you know, the words take me, and then you realize you've said it out loud. And then you change your underwear. And then, <laughs> yeah. and next thing, you know, I came home to my uh, partner, now husband, and I said, uh, you know, Anne's going to Los Angeles and set up this um, network. And he said, that's great. It's going to take forever to negotiate a deal. We live in New York, and we're never going to move. And I was like, OK, there's the spirit. And, um, <laughs> And a week later, on a Monday, Anne was working in California uh, for Rupert Murdoch, setting up what uh, became FX. And then after three months, I came in as the head of uh, production development and then public relations. That's amazing. So we've known one another for a, few, for a few years, and you've chatted quite a lot about Anne Sweeney. And we've separately talked, and there's been talk at the festival about mentors and mentees and what it takes <clears throat> to bring on talent. and. She, she was a great advocate of yours throughout your career, actually. She, yeah, I mean, I, I always tell people that great things can happen at all times of your career, and especially the first moments. As I said, I met um, my friend Kevin, the literally first five minutes of working with Morris. When I started Nickelodeon, um, I'm a morning person, and I came into the office, and as we know, the telly business, though you were all here early this morning, which I appreciate. Um, it's not necessarily early people. So I came into an absolute dark hallway, um, and there was one light on. And I looked down, I looked into the room, and there was a woman a couple of years, you know, like my peer, and she said, do you want to have breakfast? So the way I tell the story, which she hates, um, it was back in the day when a muffin became a breakfast food. <laughs> which we know it's cake, right? <laughs> yeah. And then, and you can't make it big enough. So she had a muffin the size of a cantaloupe. Um, and I was a boy, so I thought it was made a lot of sense to have a um, package of cereal that you pull off. So it was like $5 for the stupid container, plus the milk. And we sa I sat down, peeled off, ate my cereal. She ate some part of that muffin. And um, she became a friend uh, we worked together for five years, and then I worked for her for 17. Amazing. And in, in many different jobs in a couple of different cities, um, she was always this incredible partner who believed that I could do whatever I set my mind to, and I always believed I needed to do. I always believed work is a team sport. I'm not a great athlete, but I think that's where you excel, and to be there every step of the way, and sh as she still is, um, you need people. What is it about TV that, um, th that means that it's dominated by white men at the top? And, and how did Anne get to where she's got to? 
you know, you've had a look around, loads of talented women in broadcasting, yet very few are in Well, we worked, position. I mean, we worked for one of the game, certainly game changers in US and arguably global television with Geraldine Laybourne. And so we thought it's just, it was that way. Mm. That it was a society where you could be who you wanted to be and Jerry was um, and is incredibly expansive. So Anne never thought for a second, even though Anne started as Jerry's secretary, mm -hmm. Um, that she could not run or do whatever she wanted. And that legacy created so many opportunities for women in our business, certainly in the States, and a paradigm uh, for opportunities, I think, elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So, and it, you know, it's, it's still a challenge. I think we're never as diversified as we should or could be, mm -hmm. but uh, you need role models at, at the top of all these businesses for people to say, he did that, she did that, to be able to, I think, be a signpost for it. Yeah. So the Disney years were like the main chunk of your career so far. And um, uh, just a litany of hits that you, uh, you came up with again and again. Um, if anyone's got kids, they'll know Hannah Montana is the enormous hit and High School Musical. So I'd love to chat about, about one or both of those. Um, so Miley Cyrus, t talk about um, Hannah Montana, how it came about, how did you know it was gonna be a hit? How do you turn a good show into a, a global phenomenon? Well, I, I, you know, to me, what I learned, uh, the first show uh, that kind of, that worked for us um, was called Lizzie McGuire, and I got a call from a reporter, and the thing took off, and, and she was on the, um, Hillary Duff became uh, the cover of TV Guide, which back in the day was literally the most important thing. And the reporter called me and said, you know, you're set. And I said, in what way? And he said, well, you've had your hit show. <laughs> um, and you can like work off that hit show for the rest of your career. And I'm thinking, oh, that's great, because I'm 32. <laughs> um, and I didn't, you know, we didn't even, we, this is before the dot-com boom where you could retire at 35 and be a billionaire or whatever. This is like, I'm 32, I need to make money for quite some time. And, um, and then a show came after it that worked, and then, we had an idea, um, Gary Marsh, the now who runs Disney Channel Worldwide, is a great creative thinker, and he, he came in and he said, I know you're obsessed, me, with music and how music inspires kids and families, and we started putting on all these acts on television. Uh, for kids, what happens if we did this kind of Superman story where this girl is a singer at night and a regular kid by day? Well, that was all well and good, but that person had to have a voice. And for a year, I'm a big believer, I guess, in, in the world of talent of being cast contingent, that expression. Because if you can't make it work, then why do it? And Gary said, you have to meet this, this girl. So she was 12, a little, I don't know, I sound like my father saying it's like a little twig of a thing. <laughs> and, um, but she said to me. Where was this, at the offices? At, at, the, uh, at the offices, and she said, she wanted to become Hillary Duff. As someone who had worked with Hillary Duff, I was like, okay, that's the aspiration. And she had this incredible voice, for certainly for a 12 and 13 year old. And then we taped the pilot. Sorry, just, so did she sing in the office? She just stood there? Everyone had to sing in our office. Really? Every famous person you've probably ever heard sing has always sung in our office. I ran a conference table, it's not exactly Wembley, but um, And so there's you and 10 other execs, a 12-year-old yeah, girl. Yeah, and and she had no, but the thing, what, what was so clear, she had absolutely no uh, inhibition, mm -hmm. which I think we've all learned. <laughs> um, um, <laughs> yeah. The wrecking ball of many careers. Um, <laughs> yeah. But she was, she just was very self-possessed. And for me, who always felt um, that my job was not to make kids do anything or anybody do anything that they're not comfortable with. Yep. She was someone who was like, this is what I want to do, and this is how I'm going to do it. And in an instant, you're like, in, she's a star. And, and in an instant, it became just a massive thing, and next thing, it became a concert tour. And, um, and it came at the same window, which was High School Musical, which um, I always loved that when the movie, the first one exploded and people came up to me at like my gym and they said, we'd like to pitch you a movie now that this High School Musical thing works. High School Musical was the 60th Disney Channel original movie I'd worked on, six zero. And you look, it's a very Hollywoody thing. It's like, you're an overnight sensation. 
And, uh, but that was an opportunity where uh, Gary thought, wow, um, a musical. Let's take all this experience we had with music. And that became, um, we needed to find a cast. Mm -hmm. and, and your relationship with Gary, was it one of those where he would say a spark and you would build on it? Was it rowy? What your, no, give us a sense of a good creative no, the, relationship for you. It was that we, bo <coughs> we both came with ideas and then we had different skills in different parts of the relationship about how we'd manage it. And, and we, both, we both came from the creative side and we both had a business side to us and we knew how to um, work as a yin and yang and support each other, mm -hmm. which we did for you know, 14 years. Um, and including with that, I mean, you, someone comes to you and says, okay, we'd like to do a break into song musical and you're like, hmm, well, that could be a huge disaster, but it would only work if we found a director with Kenny Ortega came aboard, songwriters, um, and then a cast that became renowned out of it. And we knew Zach, because Zach had done a failed pilot. Um, Vanessa came to us. Um, I wanted, like everything we do, to be diversified in terms of the faces. I felt very strongly about it in my whole career. So we wanted a diverse cast and everybody could sing and dance. And next thing you know, it became High School Musical 1. And then as Stuart reminded me, I was telling him the story that I flew, uh, I flew the cast to Australia because I felt that if we could make it work and Australia is a very good test market in television, I find that it could work. And the reporters, testy group, I got a call and they normally they come in for 10 minutes and then leave. And we got a call from the head of PR for Australia for Disney and said they all stayed for the whole movie. They were obsessed. And I turned to Zach, I took Zach and Vanessa and Ashley and Monique, and I said to them, if this works, it, life will change forever. And I, you know, I still see all of them. And we look back at that moment where an explosion happened and it changed so many lives, including mine. Yeah, amazing, amazing. Um, so then you became, uh, from the boss of all the Disney channels worldwide, you then became chairman of Disney Studios, looking after the movies. So uh, Cars 2, which is uh, such a step up from Cars 1, I think. Um, uh, the Help, Toy Stories 2, Pirates of the Caribbean. What was it like shifting from telly into features? The budgets, the personalities? What? I, I think the, the, the great, um, I grew up in the nexus where you could go one, well, you can go in like three directions, I guess, back in the day. It was like to work in the movie business, to work in the telly business, or to work in music business. And so for me, I thought it was so great uh, working on the talent side that going into the television business, I could work in the music business, which I've done my whole career, and worked in the film business because we supported a lot of the films on the channel and I knew it was a great opportunity to connect with the, the patina of the film business. Um, once you make the change or make the decision to go into television, it's pretty much over that, that the film part. Um, and I got a call um, from uh, the CEO of Disney um, just, just pause. You got a call. So where, where do you get these calls? Because these calls seem to well, have, call, you're at home, you're in the kitchen, you're at work, talk uh, to you. I got the call in my, in, my off, in my office. It was like very not dramatic. Right. He said, do you want to get together? And he asked me to do a job that I guess was a dream job, but also brought with it um, the inevitability that I had never worked in the film business. Yeah. So covering movies for Kids Network or for FX uh, is very different. And I guess the great challenge that certainly I found was it's a very different business. Um, I love what television has become is aggregating, you de-aggregate and you make hopefully great hit shows and you aggregate and you brand it. <coughs> and you market against both the small thing and the big thing. The movie business, uh, you know, there are budgets that the marketing budgets tally up to, you know, movie companies, a billion dollars in marketing. Wow. And we work in television where everyone gives you like 20,000 quid and says, good luck with that. You know? <laughs> yeah. I'm sure like nine people are gonna hear about it. Here it's like every single time you launch a movie, you have to start the machine again. 
And I thought that was wildly challenging. And then the price of everything, if you do a movie and it costs a cheap movie, $30 million, mm -hmm. then $75 million, then $150 million. And it's really, coming out of TV, it's just the scale is just very different. Mm -hmm. And then you get judged in a very different way. While we have ratings in television, of course, um, box office, which I'm still, you know, I still check the box office. It's once you're in it, you can't get out of it, I guess. But you get judged, frankly, on a Thursday night mm -hmm. about how you do. And generally, you can't get out from under it if it doesn't do well. That's amazing. So it's, it's, it's a high stakes game. It was a fascinating experience. Um, ultimately, I think television for me, I, I, I just, I think I love the business more. Mm -hmm. I love the opportunity. Um, and so it kind of became a natural progression. It was three years of my life. I learned a lot and then uh, I got a break and got to come back to television. Was it a relief in a way when you, with that, I can't imagine that level of pressure. I kind of got a low hum of pressure, but that pressure every week, on weekend releases. Was it a relief when you decided to leave movies to go to Shine? Well, it's a, rel it's a relief and it's also, um, to go through, I think, in our business, self-reflection when everyone's watching mm. is a very um, tricky part of the equation. Um, I, you know, you realize your career is, I know yours is Stuart, you live in a very public space. Mm. So when I left um, the studio, like no one didn't know, like no one didn't mm. know. Martians called them, <laughs> and the Martians knew. And the greatest thing I got out of that experience in some ways was a break. I didn't work for nine months. Which, what did you do? Where did you go? Well, I terrorized my parents because my <laughs> parents were worried that I wouldn't go back, and um, and I did I did a lot of I guess soul searching and a lot of lunch, a lot of lunch. Um, but I because I wanted to meet people and decide what I wanted to do next. About a couple a couple of weeks after I was done. I got a call from an old friend of mine, one of my first teammates at FX, uh, Liz Murdoch, was with Murdoch, saying, you know, we should work together again. And I was like, okay, but I'm taking some time off. And she's like, okay, I'll give you some time to think about it a week later. <laughs> I think we should work together. And she and her partner, Alex Mahan, um, coerced me uh, to do something that was really fascinating for me, and that is go um, to take over their shine business in the U.S. Um, and to go to the other, you know, I don't know which is the dark side, the producer side or the commissioning side. I think everyone thinks the other side is probably the dark side, but it was fascinating for me to become a producer and deal with all the pressures and to learn that all the commissioners, and because it was a global company, get to do what I've always loved and to work on a global scale. So to be able to talk to all these colleagues around the world, find great programming, figure out how it could be adapted. And it was going, you know, I think it went along well and then got a call from uh, my current boss and said, I have an idea and I want you to do this. And I said, well, I'm working and I like what I do. And next thing you know, seven months or eight months ago, I started at Discovery and, you know, seven, eight months here, I'm here. Amazing. <clears throat> There's quite a theme, I think, in TV or media where people get to 30, late 30s or early 40s where people take a break or career change or a moment. I had one where I got fired. Um, but, uh, but, you know, people set up gin distilleries or other jobs or other careers. It's, um, it's kind of a thing now, isn't it? Do you have that thing at Discovery where you let people take sabbaticals? Or we no, no. Americans, okay. we work to the end. <laughs> <laughs> we work, to, actually, the difference, I was just in Japan, where you start your career at 21, and at 55, they reassess whether you want, they keep you. I mean, literally. Wow. Um, and at 53 years old now, that was like, kind of, it's daunting. But um, Americans, we do that, but we have no, you know, we don't know if we're going to keep our jobs yeah, through yeah, that whole yeah. period of time. Look, I think the healthiest thing is to be able to give yourself time, gap years between um, you know, high schools and universities, time, time to understand who you are, what you want to be, and where you want to go. Each job generally falls into the next, and the, every has, everyone has expectations for what you're going to do. I think even 
this between um, Shine and Discovery, my new boss, um, David Zaslov, said to me, you know, what can we do for you, you know, to ease this transition? And I said, I need time off. Mm. And he said, um, how much time exactly? <laughs> and I said, well, you know what, uh, how about two months? Mm -hmm. I'll start right after the new year. And that two months, I snap back into having time, yeah. time to think about it. And everybody wonders how you can quickly affect something and you know, people are talking about our network, which is great, and the ratings and everything else. I will tell you the two months I had in November, December, allowing me to think through what I thought discovery could be mm. was what led to quick action to affect it. And I think when you ask someone and give them no time, it's very hard to do it. So before you join, Discovery, I think, has a, has a certain image. It's quite male. It can seem corporate and a bit unwieldy, particularly to British producers, I think. Um, is that the brand you found when you turned up? or how? Well, I just um, I knew that it was a storied brand and a storied domestic and a storied international brand. Um, I realized that people, in, when you think of brands, um, often people have not experienced it in a while, what I would call essentially lapsed viewers, which you know, I think you all know about. And so I would talk to people and said, did you watch, do you watch? And people would say, I love it. And then I'd ask them what they'd watched and something that had been on a few years before. Now the network was doing fine. And my job was not to have a revolution there, but to evolve it that frankly, it went back to being for everyone. Mm -hmm. There's a male tilt to it. But I said, I'd like, why we don't have more women? Why don't we have more you know, African-Americans? Why don't we have more Latinos? Why is this brand sending people away? And my boss, who told me the day I met him uh, about this job, I knew him for a long time, said, this is what I think it needs to happen. He was, it was very insightful and very on the money. And he said, and I said, well, we have to bring people in. We have to make programming where people see themselves. So there are now women on our shows and African-Americans on our shows and Latinos. We need to be less scared of um, factual being actually factual, that you can be commercial and still tell a story, um, that things have to be connected online and on air. We live in a modern world. Um, and we also have to understand who's watching us. And one of my favorite stories was I said to Dave, um, I want to get sons. I want, I, want mother, I want mothers and girlfriends and sons to join their, their dads. So he said, well, what do you mean by sons? And I said, you know, essentially 18 to 26. And he has two, he has two kids, actually, in that age group. So he said, but I don't understand. They're not at home. And I said, look, well, generationally, I'm 53. When I got out of university, I would have known someone who moved home than like, lived anywhere. I had to get out of that house. I love my parents. I'm not going back. Today we live in a very different world where parents and kids have a very different relationship and parents actually welcome kids back. And I said, if you looked at the, uh, the latest census, 60% six of boys, 18 to 26, live with their parents. So I said, that's who I'm going for mm -hmm. because it is old school. Dad is home with a giant television, <laughs> even bigger than ever, right? Um, mom girlfriend, second wife, third wife, whatever, they go in and they want to share some time. They sit down mm -hmm. and son, who while everyone says, don't they watch on their laptop? Don't they watch on their iPad? They watch other things on their laptop, I think. <laughs> yes, they, <laughs> at night. They like one of, everybody likes to share things. And all of a sudden, our viewership went up. Our viewership went up with men, with women, with younger men, and with every, uh, all, all ethnicities. And it truly was co-viewing. One of, the, um, show, one of the clips we've got is of uh, a show you said actually typifies one of the directions you want on uh, Discovery. So tell, tell us a bit about it before we see Sure, one of, the, one of the things that I was asked to do was, um, I would say restore um, the place that documentaries had on the channel. Um, many of the documentaries, frankly, the past, which are famous, were co-productions. Um, um, some were original commissions and we decided right from the beginning, I hired um, a man named John Hoffman who had worked at HBO for 17 years, one of their heads there, um, <coughs> to go from right into the marketplace and say, we would acquire film, we would commission film, and we'd instantaneously be a player in this world because discovery means 
excuse me, that kind of storytelling, and we were capable of doing it. One of the things that was unique, which had not been really um, executed quite the same way, was we went in to um, acquire our first movie called Racing Extinction, which comes out in December, and we were competing with some known competitors, and um, the filmmaker, Luis C. Hoyos, um, is an activist. And he said, what can you provide us that these other <coughs> competitors could not do? And I said, well, we can air it in prime time um, all over the world. And he said, what does that mean? And what it means is on, uh, in December, in 200 countries and territories, in prime time, we will air this one movie, which with our goal is to reach a billion people. And how much did Racing Extinction cost? Or if you don't want to say that, what's the well, rough... It was, it was a multi-million dollar acquisition. Right. I would say, I would certainly say that. But to someone who is an activist and an Oscar-winning filmmaker, he wanted impact. Global reach. And over, literally, the expression overnight, that's what we're able to do. And in fact, the US will be the last market, which being working in global television forever in my career, I didn't care. I wanted just, I wanted to make a statement, not for statement's sake, but essentially saving our planet is no small order and working with activists to make an impact, I thought is what discovery is about. The clip I brought, which we're actually- Sorry, now, when does racing extinction happen? In December, December. early December, December, okay. early December. Um, the clip I brought, uh, we're announcing actually today another very big acquisition. Um, it's called Sherpa, and uh, a Australian f uh, filmmakers, they were telling the story of the people who go up and down Everest to help adventurers meet this crazy goal of climbing Mount Everest. Sherpa is actually the name of the people, not just their job. Their job became the verb of what is the noun. They were there for the catastrophe of last season for the avalanche. So they were taping an ordinary documentary, extraordinary people, and they captured something that is um, pretty stupefying. So do you want to show see it? it? Incredible, it looks incredible. Well, it's a human, I think the best stories we can tell are human stories. I think we can get lost that we're telling stories about places and not telling stories about people who live in places. And I think that is, you know, what the brand of Discovery is. So when you see that, it could very be, people would describe it as a story about Man Mount Everest. And this is a story about people who do the, maybe the most dangerous job in the world who got caught up in the ultimate fatality that they know every day can happen. And I just think that that fearlessness is the stories we need to tell. When does that go out, Rich? That's gonna go out next, uh, next uh, second quarter, next spring. Mm -hmm. We launched, as part of this effort, uh, a number of events. We launched something called Elevation Weekend on the network, and uh, we're all, we acquire in that product. So this is obviously a mountain story, so that's where it's gonna show up. Um, <clears throat> I want uh, people here to get a sense of what things they could pitch to you. And um, so could you give us a sense about what other things you're looking for, price points, does it need to be international in flavor? Do you need talent attached? If we could have the contents of your sure. head. Sure, sure. Um, what, what needs to, I, for me, what needs to work, frankly, is, uh, the shows need to work in the States and work pretty much everywhere else. Um, we run a business where um, we control our content and it becomes the spine of you know, networks in 220 countries and territories. Um, nothing starts as a global property and everyone doesn't know what technically works, but we're trying to essentially not do programming that's Americana per se, but often takes place in America. Our documentaries, as you see, literally are shot all over the world. Shark Week, which is you know, one of our most famous things, is shot all over the world as well. Um, we buy, um, for the most part, our series. We make, and now in our group, almost 1,000 hours between the three networks, uh, commission over 1,000 hours. Um, and would you take pictures for one-off hours as well as three parts or 10 parts? For the most part, what we buy, uh, <coughs> we buy things that we start with six hours. Mm -hmm. Documentaries we buy as one-offs, obviously, um, or limited series. Um, but in the series business, we, 
we buy things normally in groups of six, mm -hmm. and then when things are successful, as we have uh, thank thankfully a lot now, orders can climb to 20 episodes or, or a little bit more. Um, they, they er they're in areas that we're very successful, surviving you know, in the wilderness is something we've done very well with. We're a big, uh, we do a lot of automotive uh, motoring programming, which has done incredibly well for us. Um, these epic jobs that started, frankly, with Deadliest Catch, having uh, arguably its best season after 11 years, um, and just got a, another Emmy nomination. Um, so jobs that are um, challenging, not necessarily death-defying by their very essence. Um, we've reintroduced um, crime, uh, but T we don't tell. Tell us about that. That's yeah, we don't. Crime was a big part of the channel for a long time, but it's not about the the victim per se in the storytelling. It's about those who um, figure it out. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have a show that uh, is coming at the beginning of the year called Killing Fields. That um, it's kind of a crazy story. Um, people who kill people think they're taking them to remote places but in the same community is the same remote place. Oh my God, it's the same remote place. So I'm not saying everyone runs into each other, <laughs> but um, I'm not saying they don't either. So it sounds very Sopranos. Imagine seeing you here. Yeah, it seems very Sopranos-esque, but there are places, I tell people, if someone says to you in California, they'd like to take you out to the Mojave Desert, don't go 133 unsolved cases. Um, but there, we picked a place um, working with a production company uh, called Sirens, and then we were very lucky. I wanted to elevate it with a certain kind of storytelling, and I turned to one of the great, to me, storytellers of our day, Tom Fontana, who had done, my, my, my favorite show is St. Elsewhere, but um, you know, Homicide and Oz, which was, I think, also mm -hmm. one of the great shows of our time. He had never done um, factual and Amazing. scripted, and his partner is Barry Levinson, who's uh, direct and produce many movies. So they came on to help us tell the, these stories because they know how to, they're great storytellers. So crime is another thing that we're, we're working in. Um, how much would you pay for that type of series per hour? Things are- A million dollars an hour or? Not, I mean, it's, uh, I would say the range could be from 350,000 US to 600 mm -hmm. is kind of, I would say, the, the, Depending broad, on the, run the, the broadest and range yeah. and, and what we do, like survival shows. We have now this giant, well, now we have two hit shows with Naked and Afraid and Naked and Afraid XL. They're expensive because we shoot them, you know, each couple goes to like these faraway places. So they're very expensive to shoot versus some things that, you know, you shoot locally. Sure. But that's kind of the lay of the land. And Animal cool. Planet, we're looking for shows that often um, have animals, shockingly enough. <laughs> Um, and science, uh, which is a brand that continues to grow for us, um, trying to make science um, not palatable but interesting. Palatable, I think, is a, you know a very low bar, but interesting to consumers and viewers in a world where um, science and technology is so important and so much of a part of our technolo technologically driven world. So, Science Channel is not just a channel for people who once were science teachers, but it's about you know the Mark Zuckerbergization of our world young people who love science and are not unapolo they're unapologetic lovers of it. Did you see, you saw Armando's speech uh, last night, and he was, uh, in terms of science this is, whereabouts on the geek spectrum would you be? He talks about what, watching Horizon documentaries when he was a kid about uh, satellites and Pluto. Is that a bit too geek? Is if it more? We're saying on a scale of one to 10, <laughs> geek being a 10, uh, I would say, I'm an aspiring four. All right, cool. I'm moving, I'm, I mean, I'm. <laughs> For the science channel, that's the topic. Yeah, well, I'm is. learning, I'm learning. I mean, I've never learned so much in my career, both about what I'm doing for a living, and I learned so much from the shows. Mm -hmm. what, what's great about Discovery, it was founded on this issue or this concept of curiosity and a asking questions and answering them. Mm -hmm. And I think we thirst, I personally thirst to learn. Mm -hmm. And you realize in so much of what we're surrounded with, we learn about maybe human experience, but we don't learn facts and things. And I come away from our shows on all the channels, and I'm like, and I talk about it. It's like a dinner table. I come to the dinner table. It's like, like Sherpa. I was just saying to Stuart, did you know that Sherpa is the name of the people, not just what they do? And people want to be smart, and the people want to be smarter. So in a world of search, 
seems like the right brand. And for me, I love learning, so it's cool. And Science Channel, would that be more male or younger than Discovery? Just they're all, they're all similar, um, mm -hmm. kind of 60, 40 male, female cool. in, in our market. It's yeah. different, from, you know, it's, we have these channels, thank God, all over the world that um, I get to work with and partner with. And so they're different in different places. So I'm really speaking, as always, about the States. Yeah. So we've got um, 10 minutes left. I uh, thought we could open it up to questions. If not, there's a whole lot of other things I could ask. Um, so I don't know if there's any questions. Uh, at the very back, the, um, you, yeah, who's that one? Yeah. <laughs> just hang on a tick, actually. Yeah. Um, you talked just now a little bit about people learning from your shows. To what extent do you think that online formats and an online companion pieces to broadcast television can help that? And, and is Discovery making any plays in that space? Well, it's endemic to what we do is you must have um, a deepening of the storytelling where you can, which is digital for the most part. Uh, like, for instance, this year for Shark Week, we did uh, 19 hours of documentaries, and we launched by far the most robust online shark, um, shark information. We launched a Sharkopedia, you know, I love, we, I can brand anything, <laughs> um, with, um, with all this information. I don't think it's a mystery. I mean, we're very lucky. It was the best um, Shark Week we had in history in 28 years. I don't think it's an accident that it was connected to online, because for people to go on and check it out, we also, at our company, which is not part of my group, we have a whole raft of digital networks. Um, we are now working very closely with them to be able to share going both ways. I don't think we live in a world that linear alone is possible to be just a standalone, but I think there are times where stories are good in 45 minute pieces and five minute pieces and one minute pieces. And you have to figure out how it all fits together. Any more? Uh, this lady with blonde hair. I say blonde, but it's got highlights too. It's a <laughs> textured. I did not highlight it, sorry. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Hi, Rich, how are you? Um, I'd love your thoughts and predictions um, on uh, factual, non scripted relative to drama, not just in the US, but because we're all thinking more globally. Uh, you know, is the, do you think the drama bubble is going to burst? Is it going to get bigger? And, and the role that factual can play in. In, in global audiences? Sure. I, when I took the job, everyone was, there was a general moan that unscripted, the bubble had burst and things weren't working and we were going to hell in a handbasket. Our network finished July as the number one network, uh, cable network, doing unscripted programming. I don't have any scripted programming at present on the network. I don't believe that anybody, that these jobs and businesses are going away. I do believe they constantly need you know, innovation. I think the great challenge that we're probably meeting in our business now is um, about five to seven years ago, um, the spending spree of putting all these companies together and consolidation led to a lot of people um, getting a lot of, frankly, money. And then they had to face the fact whether after they did earnouts, whether they wanted to still do it. And you know what? It's a very thin on the ground business because there's so many people doing it. And what I, um, I, I'm obsessed, as I think you can clearly see, I'm passionate about what I do. I want to work with people who are too. So I think what we're, what's incumbent on all of us is to find those people who have those stories to tell. Um, that it's not about an episode order, it's about the story. It's about the people you find, the things you learn. And um, Unscripted has I think a great legacy and a great opportunity going forward. And I think we're just positive going forward that there's great opportunity. And that is, and that's a, we know it's a global opportunity. People are just, they wanna, they wanna see stories about people like them or people not like them. And that's what we do. So a question from this lady here with the uh, beard. <laughs> with Thanks, Jess. <laughs> John Rich, Keeling. John Keeling, been a while. Um, you've got, I just wanted to ask you, you've got Phil Craig now in London, uh, having done a stint at the ABC in Australia. You've got yourself in the US, having spent your time in a porter cabin in Australia and gone out to shine. Um, and you've got Marjorie Kaplan coming over. Um, do you feel uh, there's now a platform of talent at Discovery to 
increase the global mix of your content creatively? Do you have a vision for content coming from a wider area? The, the one word answer is absolutely. I mean, my remit is the US, but my remit, frankly, whether it's the US or the global, different jobs I've had, as you know, um, stories come from a million places. And it's to be provincial is to think they come from one place, and that place and it's, would be provincial if you think it just comes from the States. What was great about Shine for me was believing that and then working with a group of people who can identify things in different places. We have people in offices, in like hundreds of offices. And I've, and I've been and talked to a lot of people, and I said, look, you have this opportunity to, you watch television, and you may have something on in Discovery Channel Romania that works for you that might work for us. Or, because you're in Romania, you may see something on another network that may work for us. To be able to empower an organization, whether they report to you or not, it doesn't matter. To make people their eyes and ears, and for us as the biggest pay TV group, is the most exciting job. And I think that's when Marjorie, it was uh, incredible for me because I'm a big fan. I know Marjorie for a very long time. People may not know who Marjorie is. Marjorie was uh, formerly ran TLC, um, Velocity, and Animal Planet. And she just took over a position that she starts. We swap out our jobs in, in two weeks uh, to be uh, essentially global, uh, a president of global programming. So for her and I to be able to look out with our teams and find those stories and be able to swap them back and forth is a must. But it comes from like-minded people. She's a great brand builder. She knows what the product is. And we just have to unlock you know, the Kraken. The Kraken is the eyes and ears of your organization around the world and say, watch and talk about. Watch, create. Watch, adapt. But start with watching. Rich, one of the things we talked about is the difficulty Discovery previously had with Indies. That Indies might pitch something and Discovery would take all rights. Is it that cut and dry? Um, we control our content. I, it's the model that we can afford the content we make for the 1,000 hours. Um, we, it's kind of become more the way of the world, I would say, certainly in, with the US companies. Um, they're all different models. We have different models, certainly, in our documentary sometimes that we have in our scripted, or I mean, our unscripted series. Um, I don't think it's changing anytime soon because pro production is getting more expensive. Mm -hmm. And we have the opportunity to um, have these shows. Over 90% of our content from the US airs on the channels around the world. And so how would indies make money from making something from you guys so they're not just a, a produ producer for hire then? Well, honestly, I'm not sure that it's... Everyone has to decide what, how they make their money. I, I, for producer for hire still, we pay very handsomely for great talent around the world to make programming for us, mm -hmm. and that's our model. Yeah. You can always say no if you do, and now that you know the network is doing really well, it's pretty rare that people do say no. But I understand that the different models of Shine, we had a model where we had ownership, but I was seeing in the last year of working with um, the team at Shine, the networks pretty much were shutting us down and saying there is no model for you to have a piece of the action. And frankly, if you have a piece of the action, and it becomes a um, crazy quilt of things, it's very hard to make money on it than yourselves. Mm -hmm. So I guess you have to find out what you think you're valued at and be able to get it at the front end of the engine and um, maybe less in the back end of the engine. Cool. Any more questions? Uh, you, um, with your two fingers holding up like that. Yeah, you. Highlights. I didn't realize highlights were a bad thing. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Rich. I'm um, just wondering, what are your plans for scripted on Discovery? Is the door closed, or is it slightly open? No, the door is very open. We've announced um, our first project with a UK production company, Raw, which is, um, I think, their extraordinary, mm. extraordinary team. Um, we're soon to announce a second, uh, probably another two. I think. Um, Drama needs to be complementary to our schedule, I think part of it, but I don't see a, you know, a move to 50-50, you know, I would say. If I can get to five to 10% of the schedule, I think there's stories I can tell. For me, one of the 10 poles, or for the network, one of the 10 poles for Discovery is history. 
History is very hard to tell in a series, but it's great to be able to tell in a scripted series. Um, so we're telling, you know, the first project with Raw is the story of the creation of uh, Harley Davidson, the motorcycle company, which was the turn of the century that made Steve Jobs look like he was learning from them, two brothers and a friend. And is this six one hours? Six one one hours. And I just think it's the story of innovation, the story of branding, the story Mm -hmm. of, um, it's like the magic of of creation. And um, so yes, we're very open and there are different ways to get the job done and we hope that all of them air everywhere. Probably got time for one last question. This person here, him. John, close friend, but I'm pretending I'm being professional. Ex-lover. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Hi, Rich. Um, I, I read a few things about you saying you sort of wanted to move away from the shock tactics that sort of Discovery have done in the past. But with your sort of new strategy, I mean, how do you intend to disrupt, but maybe by being sort of more authentic? What's the sort of disrupting, disruption factor? Um, We all have to be commercial, and no one understands that more than me. Um, I think it's about reaching people where they are, marketing to them so they know you have programming for them. Um, I guess the, the take towards leaning into more, or trying to lean into more authentic, authentic storytelling, I think the disruption is, I experience people running to us now because they think we're looking in uncertain times for things we can grasp onto and things we can grow with and learn about. And all of a sudden, what was old was new again. And maybe the greatest disruption often is that. I don't need to reinvent. I don't need to make something out of whole cloth. I need to be able, and we need to as a team, satisfy basic human instinct, (laughs) I guess of discovery, if basic human instinct is asking questions and being curious, maybe the most disruptive thing in this world is actually answering a question. And I think satisfying someone's curiosity, which we all think of as something so basic, could be something so extreme and disruptive in and of itself. We just are doing it with modern approaches and hopefully with great storytellers and great partners. But I look at my, I have a nine-year-old nephew who is constantly asking questions. And all he wants is an answer. And if we as a television brand, as a network group can do that, I think that's why people come. Well, I think we need to wrap it up there. Uh, I want to thank Creative Scotland, our sponsors, British Film Commission. Uh, Thanks to Sasha, Vicky, and Jane for your help. Most of all, for being so open and insightful. Thanks, Rich. Thank you. (laughs)